What if I told you that one of the most advanced aircraft in US history was almost cancelled before it ever flew? That the plane which now delivers tanks, troops, and food across the world barely survived boardroom battles, congressional hearings, and engineering disasters? This is the story of the C-17 Globemaster III, and of how the US chose risk, innovation, and persistence over the comfort of what was already known. At the start of the 1980s, the Air Force faced a crisis. Its airlift fleet was falling apart. The C-141 Starlifter, the dependable workhorse of Vietnam and the Cold War, was cracking under stress. It simply could not carry the new generation of armored vehicles and equipment. The huge C-5 Galaxy, built by Lockheed, could carry the weight but demanded long, perfect runways and vast maintenance crews. The small C-130 Hercules was tough but limited in range and payload. The Air Force needed something that didn't yet exist, a jet that could haul massive cargo across oceans yet land on rough, short airstrips close to the front lines. So in 1981, the Pentagon launched the CX program, a contest to design a transport aircraft that could do everything. The rules were brutal. Carry 170,000 pounds of cargo more than 2,400 miles, take off from a 3,500-foot runway, and land again with precision. It had to be fast, reliable, cheap to maintain, and capable of flying into places no other jet dared go. Two giants stepped forward. Lockheed, already the established partner, proposed an upgraded version of the C-5 Galaxy. Larger wings, new avionics, familiar systems. Safe, predictable, and relatively inexpensive. McDonnell Douglas, on the other hand, decided to gamble. Its engineers imagined a completely new machine. High wing, four engines, digital fly-by-wire, wide cargo hold, and the ability to land almost anywhere. They promised a jet that would combine the power of a strategic hauler with the agility of a tactical one. Inside the Pentagon, opinions split. Half the generals argued for Lockheed's dependable option. The others urged boldness. If we only repeat what worked yesterday, one senior officer said, we'll lose tomorrow. After months of debate, the Air Force chose McDonnell Douglas. On paper, it was a triumph of vision. In practice, it was the beginning of chaos. Development immediately ran into trouble. The first prototype, rolled out in 1990, was heavier than expected. Its software unstable, its landing gear unreliable. Each fix added more cost. By 1992, with the Cold War ending and budget shrinking, the C-17 looked like a disaster. Headlines screamed about billions wasted. Engineers worked through night trying to make deadlines that slipped again and again. Lockheed saw its chance. Lobbyists whispered through Washington. We could upgrade the C-5 for half the money. Why chase fantasies when the future is already built? Congress listened. Committees met. Cancellation seemed inevitable. Then came the day that changed everything. During a tense hearing, Air Force General Ronald Fogelman looked at the senators and said quietly, If we cancel the C-17, we lose the future of air mobility. It was a single sentence, but it saved the program. McDonnell Douglas doubled down. The team tore the airplane apart and rebuilt it piece by piece. They switched to lighter alloys, redesigned the wings for greater lift, strengthened the landing gear, and rewrote the entire flight control system. They created new cargo handling systems that let crews load tanks in minutes instead of hours. Every failure became a problem to solve, not an excuse. By 1994, the transformation was visible. Test pilots began returning with grins instead of complaints. The C-17 could land on dirt strips barely 3,000 feet long and take off again with full cargo. It could reverse on its own engines, taxi backwards, and pivot in tight spaces. It handled like a much smaller jet but carried loads larger than anything its size. The real test came in 1995 during the peacekeeping mission in Bosnia. A C-17 touched down on the rough, uneven runway at Tuzla, delivered its supplies, and lifted off again without a scratch. The video went straight to Congress. Suddenly, the same politicians who had doubted the project were calling it indispensable. Orders increased. The C-17 was no longer a problem child. It was the Air Force's pride. Behind the scenes, politics still mattered. The production line in Long Beach, California supported more than 30,000 jobs across 17 states. Killing the plane would have meant economic pain for a dozen congressional districts. Support solidified, and the aircraft that had been one vote away from death became unstoppable. In 1997, Boeing acquired the struggling McDonnell Douglas and took over the C-17. Under Boeing, the design matured, costs dropped, reliability soared, and the program finally earned the trust of the crews who flew it. Then the world changed again. After the September 11 attacks, America needed rapid global reach. In Afghanistan, the C-17 proved irreplaceable. It could carry tanks and troops directly to rough mountain bases where no other jet could land. Pilots called it the flying truck that never quits. During the Iraq invasion, C-17s flew through sandstorms and crosswinds, hauling entire armored brigades into the desert. When troops needed evacuation or ammunition, it was the C-17 that showed up. But the aircraft's legacy didn't end on battlefields. 
When disaster struck, the great giants were always the first to appear. During the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, C-17s delivered water, food, and medical aid to devastated coasts. After the 2010 Haiti earthquake, they landed on cracked runways carrying rescue teams and generators. They flew into Japan after the 2011 tsunami and into the Philippines after Typhoon Haiyan. In 2021, during the chaotic Kabul evacuation, one C-17 lifted off with 823 people aboard, the most ever carried by a single aircraft. The photo of that crowded cargo bay became a global symbol of both desperation and hope. Today, more than 275 C-17s operate around the world. The United States fleet alone has logged over 3 million flight hours, and analysts expect them to serve into the 2050s. Technically, the plane is a masterpiece. Each of its four Pratt & Whitney F-117 engines produces 40,000 pounds of thrust, enough to push the 280-ton jet off a short runway and climb like a fighter. Its advanced wing design allows steep approaches and sharp turns even at low speeds. Its fly-by-wire controls make it astonishingly precise. The landing gear spreads the weight across 12 wheels so it can operate from gravel or grass. The cargo bay is large enough for an M1 Abrams tank, three helicopters, or more than 100 paratroopers. Lockheed C-5M Super Galaxy still carries heavier loads, but it needs ideal conditions. The C-17 thrives where conditions are worst. It was built for chaos, for broken runways, tight deadlines, and impossible missions. Inside, crews say it feels alive. The cockpit glows with modern displays. The controls respond instantly. Loadmasters move cargo with powered rollers and digital readouts. Maintenance crews love it because it rarely complains. Pilots love it because it forgives mistakes. One officer called it a heavy jet that thinks it's a helicopter. Over time, the C-17 reshaped American strategy. Instead of relying on huge overseas bases, the military began to plan around rapid mobility. Small hubs, quick turnarounds, flexible deployments. The C-17 made global reach practical. It also blurred the line between war and relief. One week, the jet might drop paratroopers into combat. The next, it would deliver blankets and medicine to earthquake victims. It became both warrior and humanitarian, carrying destruction and salvation in the same cargo hold. Behind every flight are the people who built it. Many of the original McDonnell Douglas engineers still visit air shows to watch their creation roar ahead. They remember sleepless nights, failed tests, and the moment when Congress nearly killed their dream. For them, each takeoff is personal proof that persistence works, and the pilots who fly it today understand that heritage. They know the jet's history, the politics, the risks, the near misses. They know that when they push the throttles forward and feel the surge of 160,000 pounds of thrust, they are flying something that almost never existed. When the Pentagon chose the C-17 instead of Lockheed's safer proposal, it did more than select a contractor. It made a statement. It said that progress demands courage, that perfection grows from failure, and that sometimes the biggest leaps come from refusing to play it safe. Look at a C-17 taking off and you can see that philosophy in motion. The wings flex, the engines thunder, and 160 tons of steel defy gravity with effortless grace. In seconds, it's airborne, climbing into the clouds, bound for a battlefield or a disaster zone half a world away. It's hard not to feel something watching it. Pride, awe, maybe even gratitude, because this grey machine is more than a transport. It's a flying symbol of determination. Proof that even in a world of politics and budget cuts, engineering brilliance can still rise. Somewhere tonight, a C-17 sits on a lonely airstrip. Inside, pilots run checklists while the ramp closes. The engines start, the runway lights blur, and the jet begins to roll. Outside, the sound grows into a roar that shakes the ground. Then, almost gently, it lifts into the night. That sight, that moment when 160 tons of aluminum and purpose leave the Earth, carries the entire history of the program. The failures, the arguments, the redesigns, the second chances, and the faith that something better could be built. The C-17 was born from crisis, saved by courage, and perfected by persistence. It bridges continents, delivers hope, and reminds us that the hardest projects often leave the strongest legacies. It isn't just a plane, it's a promise. A promise that when vision meets determination, even gravity can be negotiated, and even the heaviest dreams can fly.